Data ethics is a branch of ethics that evaluates data practices with the potential to adversely impact on people and society. Different practices include the collection, classification, storage, use, sharing and retention of data, all of which have different ethical considerations that affect people. Unfortunately, there is no shortage of stories about unethical data practices. Let's start with a couple of light-hearted examples that soon extrapolate into much more serious issues. Back in January of 2018, Twitter introduced an auto-cropping AI that detected the most interesting part of your image and cropped the preview photo to match. This worked with everything from aeroplane wings to people. However, it was later shown to be biased. The photo that highlighted the bias most clearly was this large vertical picture containing an image of Mitch McConnell and Barack Obama separated by a large amount of white space. Regardless of which gentleman was on top, or the colour of the tie, in all cases the image cropper would zone in on Mitch McConnell for all the preview images. This only changed when the colours in the image were inverted and the cropper then selected Barack. Upon investigation, Twitter discovered that their algorithm had an 8% difference in favour of women over men, a 4% difference favouring white people over black people of both sexes, a 7% difference favouring white women over black women, and a 2% difference in favour of white men over black men. While these numbers don't sound large, Twitter still faced a lot of backlash and as a result decided to remove the algorithm and replace it with a tool that allows for users to preview and customise crops prior to publication. In this case, it was decided that a human bias is better, as it is clear who to blame. In 2017, a Facebook employee in Nigeria shared this footage of a minor inconvenience that speaks to tech's larger diversity problem. The white man easily gets soap from the dispenser, but the dark-skinned black man doesn't. These types of soap dispensers use an optic sensor to detect when a hand is placed underneath. These sensors rely on light bouncing back from the skin. The darker the skin on the Fitzpatrick scale, the more difficult it is for the light to bounce back. More advanced versions of the sensors adjust the brightness of the light to compensate for different ambient light conditions in order to detect darker skin tones more consistently. A bit like some bedroom clocks adjust to day and night. While soap dispensers are a more light-hearted example, the same problem has been documented in wearable fitness trackers, heart rate monitors, and also in medical applications. It's clear then that there's still work to be done in ensuring that technology is as accessible and inclusive for people of all skin tones. Advancements in healthcare have been life-saving, but there is still a long way to go to make it equitable and fair for everyone. Take for example skin cancer. If diagnosed at the earliest stage, individuals with melanoma have a 100% chance of surviving over a year. However, that percentage decreases to 53% when diagnosed at the latest stage. Individuals with non-white skin, whilst less likely to develop skin cancer, have been found to have a lower five-year survival rate, just 70%, compared to white individuals where this figure is over 90%. This is due to the lack of experience and awareness concerning skin cancer diagnosis among non-white individuals. Put simply, research hasn't been done and experience is low. To combat this issue, many companies have developed machine learning technologies to diagnose skin cancer early. Many claim to provide solutions that are more accurate than trained dermatologists. However, analysis of some of the datasets used to train the algorithms in these technologies has uncovered flaws. For instance, the first derm dataset contains over 63,000 images of skin cancer from which the machine learns. However, only 5-10% to of these images are of black patients. Some have suggested that more variety is needed in the data, making a more 50-50 balance. Others believe, however, that we should train a different system using a predominantly non-white set of images. This could be more effective, maintain higher accuracy for all skin tones and give greater overall benefits. It is not just non-white people who are excluded from medical research. In her book Invisible Women, Caroline Credo Perez highlights the lack of inclusivity in the design of many things, such as cars. Among other examples, Caroline reveals how women are 47% more likely to be seriously injured in a car accident due to sexist seatbelt design. Machines are learning from us, including our bad habits and failure to think inclusively. Inclusive thinking is at the foundation of fairness. 
Human rights go some way to protecting individuals, but are they really effective? Human rights states that everyone is entitled to a fair trial. So let's look to crime and justice to see how data is helping or hindering here. In crime and justice, rating a risk of future crime is often done in conjunction with an evaluation of rehabilitation needs. This helps ensure that aspects such as jail term and type of prison match the likelihood of reoffense. But is using an algorithm to predict risk of recidivism a good idea? Take Vernon Prater, convicted of two armed robberies and one attempted armed robbery. His risk score, according to the algorithm, three. Compare this to Breacha Borden, convicted of four juvenile misdemeanors, risk score, eight. I'm sure you can see the main difference between these two pictures. In 2014, then US Attorney General Eric Holder warned that risk scores might be injecting bias into the courts. He called for the US Sentencing Commission to study their use. No such study was launched, so it took an independent body, ProPublica, to uncover the hidden effect of algorithms in the criminal justice system. The score proved remarkably unreliable in forecasting violent crime. Only 20% of people predicted to commit violent crimes actually went on to do so. Even when the crime is basically the same, the risk scores are drastically different. Overall, North Point's assessment tool correctly predicts recidivism 61% of the time. But blacks are almost twice as likely as whites to be labelled as higher risk but not actually re-offend. It makes the opposite mistake amongst whites, who are given lower risk scores but go on to commit other crimes. North Point insisted that the tool was accurate under its own measure of fairness. They published a technical analysis of the data that was used in ProPublica's study, challenging the regression models, classification terms and measures of discrimination used by ProPublica. Their central rebuttal was the lapse on ProPublica's part to take into account the different base rates of recidivism for blacks and whites. Zooming out from the case at hand, large-scale use of algorithms in any domain has common issues that need attention. Since data is often tainted with historic and structural biases, usage of such data in training perpetuates a runaway feedback loop or a garbage-in, garbage-out phenomena in future predictions by their algorithm. This obstructs progress and keeps societies trapped in their own mirror image of status quo. So it's crucial to consider the notion of fairness used in algorithms design. While North Point focused on accurately predicting defendants who had a likelihood to re-offend, ProPublica was more concerned with defendants who did not end up re-offending and were mistakenly classified as high risk. Their competing notions of fairness led to their statistical conflict, even though each was right in its own context. Since it is impossible for a model to satisfy all fairness criteria. Defining and prioritising what we consider fair as a society is of utmost importance in our endeavour to balance the harms and benefits of such technological solutions. One area that has to balance fairness and risk is insurance. We all know that insurance quotes are not equal and change daily depending on a confusing set of inputs. The most important thing to look for then, if we can't have equality, is fairness. Are insurance quotes fair? In 2018, it was discovered that car insurance companies in the UK were discriminating against people with ethnic sounding names. They raised prices to three times that of people with non-ethnic sounding names. Significantly in these findings, it was only the first name that was different between the two quotes. All other details entered such as address, car, mileage, job, and nationality were all exactly the same. Since then, independent studies have found that not much has changed and there is still a large ethnicity penalty in the UK insurance market. Clearly, there is still more to be done to ensure that insurance is offered fairly and does not end up discriminating based upon factors that have very little to do with risk. So we've seen many instances where machines have discriminated against people of colour or different backgrounds. Let's have a look at different examples and specifically at image recognition. Once upon a time, the US Army challenged a company to develop a way to automatically detect tanks hidden in trees. Neural networks seemed like the solution. So they took 200 photos, 100 of tanks in trees and 100 of trees and trained a neural network on 50 photos of each type of picture. The network learned well from this set, outputting yes for the 50 camouflage tanks and no for the others. They used the remaining 100 photos for a real test. 
and the neural network cunningly got all of them right. The researchers thought they had done it and handed the project to the Pentagon. But the Pentagon was not happy with the results, saying that the neural network did no better than chance at discriminating photos. It turns out that the researchers' photos of camouflaged tanks were all taken on cloudy days, while photos of plain forest were all from sunny days. The neural network did not actually learn how to detect tanks after all, rather it learned what kind of weather made it more or less likely that tanks would be present. Unfortunately, this story is not true, but let it be a reminder for anyone who deals with images, including machine learning researchers, data scientists and software developers. Bias in training data is one of the biggest challenges that everyone needs to be aware of and address. Check your data carefully. Avoid scenarios where your system is likely to learn false correlations. Just because your algorithm gives the right answers does not mean it has learned to do the right tasks. You would have thought this little story from the 1960s would have acted as a cautionary tale for anyone dealing with images. Unfortunately not. In November of 2016, Engineering researchers Xiaolin Wu and Zhi Zhang posted an article on archive.org entitled Automated Inference on Criminality Using Face Images. In their article, Wu and Zhang explore the use case of machine learning to detect features of the human face that are associated with criminality. They claim to have developed algorithms that can use a simple headshot to distinguish between criminals and non-criminals with high accuracy. But are these algorithms truly objective? Wu and Zhang claim that, unlike a human examiner or judge, the computer vision algorithm or classifier has absolutely no subjective baggages, having no emotions, no biases due to past experience, race, religion, political doctrine, gender, age, etc., no mental fatigue, no preconditioning of a bad sleep or meal. The automated inference of criminality, they claim, eliminates the variable of mechanical accuracy altogether. But the idea that a computer algorithm can be completely objective is just not true. So let's look at the images of criminals and non-criminals they use to train their algorithm and see if there is no bias, as they claim. The first and probably most prominent source of bias is that the images of non-criminals have been posted to websites presumably designed for promotional purposes, be they company websites or personal profiles. Many of these images will have been chosen by the photo subject themselves, and people usually pick photos of themselves that convey a positive impression. By contrast, the images from the set of criminals are described as ID photographs. While it is unclear exactly what this means, it is a pretty good guess that these have been selected neither by the individual depicted, nor with the aim of casting the individuals in favourable light. A second source of bias is that the authors are using photographs of convicted criminals. As a result, even if there is some signal here, the machine algorithm could just as easily be responding to the facial features that make someone likely to be convicted by a jury, rather than by facial features correlated with actually committing a crime. I mean, not that juries would ever convict people based upon looks, right? Sadly, a recent study has found that juries do judge people on looks, and unattractive individuals are more likely to be found guilty in jury trials than their more attractive peers. In this case, the first bias is the key one. None of the criminals are smiling, while the non-criminals are. Wu and Zhang actually ended up building a smile detector. So the next time you get caught on CCTV, remember to smile and look your best. Biases in image and image recognition systems result from how these systems have been trained. Understanding this history of image recognition, training data can go a long way to tell us why newer systems are showing biases. In recent times, there has been an explosion in GPT models, and popular ones such as ChatGPT and DALI 2 have been gaining a lot of attention. DALI 2, for example, is an image GPT model that can create realistic images and art from a given description. These models have shown incredible capabilities, but they also come with their own set of biases. Researchers have shown that such models are susceptible to bias, particularly towards women, where a cropped image of a face will be completed with a background from a home or a domestic setting, while a man will be situated in a business or a professional setting. To add to this, the woman's clothing will be overly sexualized, such as wearing a bikini. To understand these biases, we need to look back at the origins of the training data. In 1966, Marvin Minsky was a young professor at MIT, making a name for himself in the emerging field of artificial intelligence. 
Deciding the ability to interpret images was a core feature of intelligence. Minsky turned to an undergraduate student, Gerard Suzman, and asked him to spend the summer linking a camera to a computer and getting the computer to describe what it saw. Needless to say, the project of getting computers to see was much harder than anyone expected and would take a lot longer than a single summer. After decades of fits and starts, it wasn't until the acceleration of technologies in the 1990s allowed the building of probabilistic modelling and learning techniques at scale. This led to the current moment, in which challenges such as object detection and facial recognition have largely been solved. This arc of inevitability recurs in many AI narratives, where it is assumed that ongoing technical improvements will resolve all problems and limitations. But can it? While the technical problem of recognising an object in an image is solved, this is very different from the problem of labelling the object that can actually teach machines not just to see, but to identify and label what they see. For this to happen, we need to teach machines what the objects they are seeing are. One of the most significant training sets in the history of AI so far is ImageNet. ImageNet is a dataset of extraordinary scope and ambition. Over several years of development, ImageNet grew enormous. The development team scraped a collection of many millions of images from the internet and briefly became the world's largest academic user of Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Using an army of piecemeal workers to sort an average of 50 images per minute into thousands of categories. When it was finished, ImageNet consisted of over 14 million labelled images, organised into some more than 20,000 categories. ImageNet quickly became a critical asset for computer vision research. At the time, no one saw that ImageNet was actually flawed and would eventually suffer a significant downfall due to its bias. Images scraped from the web emphasised the human biases of the time, which is further exacerbated by the taxonomy used to label those images. The underlying structure of ImageNet is based upon the semantic structure of WordNet, a database of word classifications developed at Princeton University in the 1980s. The taxonomy is organised into nested hierarchies, going from general concepts to more specific ones. The classification system is broadly similar to those used in libraries in order to classify books into increasingly specific categories. WordNet itself is based upon the old Library of Congress classification system, famously under which this historically used to classify LGBTQ-themed books into the category Abnormal Sexual Relations, including Sexual Crimes. The American Library Association's Task Force on Gay Liberation finally convinced the Library of Congress to change this classification in 1972 after a sustained campaign. Fields of information science and technology studies have long shown all taxonomies or classification systems are political. The biggest problem in WordNet unsurprisingly exists in the person category. ImageNet consists of 2,833 subcategories under the top level category, person. ImageNet classifies people into a huge range of types including race, nationality, profession, economic status, behaviour, character and even morality. Delving into the depths of the person categories, the classifications of humans within it take a sharp and dark turn. There are categories for bad person, cool girl, drug addict, closet queen, convict, crazy, failure, flop. I'll stop there as alphabetically the next word is even less suitable for use in a video, but you get the point. In January 2019, images in the ImageNet's person category began disappearing. Suddenly, 1.2 million photos were no longer accessible on Stanford University servers. Gone were the pictures of cheerleaders, scuba divers, welders, altar boys, retirees and pilots. The picture of a man drinking beer characterised as an alcoholic disappeared, as did the pictures of a woman in a bikini dubbed as a slattern, and a young boy classified as a loser. Removing these datasets may seem like a victory, but it also removes an important forensic method to understand how AI systems work. Researchers are now unable to see how the assumptions, labels and the classificatory approaches have been replicated in new systems, or trace the provenance of skews and biases exhibited in working systems. And it isn't only the taxonomy of images that face this problem. Many music classification systems still have a world music category that conveniently acts as a place for non-Western music. The same is true of museum collections. As they emerge online, these expose biases in the ways curators and collectors historically viewed the world. Again, both of these suffer the same problem as image nets. We are flattening the world and losing the nuance while also emphasising certain worldviews of certain people. Addressing these challenges is complex, 
But we shouldn't simply delete data sets that have served as the historical source for AI systems that are now in widespread use. We need to preserve these data sets for future scrutiny so we can learn from our mistakes and not just hide them. We don't want black box AI, and researchers deleting data will only perpetuate this problem. It is scary to think, then, that a limited amount of biased data forms the basis of a huge amount of AI systems. As systems build on top of one another, so do the biases and limitations perpetuate. Let's end with another example where bias in existing data has resulted in the exclusion of large swathes of society. Data ethics isn't just about personal data. There are huge amounts of data practices involving non-personal data that can also cause harm or exclude people. Let's take a look at Pokemon Go as an example. Pokemon Go is a location-based augmented reality game by Ninantic and in collaboration with Nintendo. Players use their mobile device GPS to locate, capture, battle and train virtual Pokemon. And in order to do that, they need to visit Pokestops. Pokestops are checkpoints where players can collect Pokeballs and other items for free. And they are placed at specific locations on the map, alongside gyms where players can battle other Pokemon. So where are these locations derived from? In the case of Pokemon Go, Ninantic used data from a previous game called Ingress. Ingress was also a location-based real-world augmented reality game, where players had to capture portals instead of Pokemon. The locations of these portals were crowdsourced from the historical marker database and Ingress players. But here's the problem. The majority of database contributions were from young, white and people from better off communities. This means there were gaps in the data, and this resulted in poker stops being placed less frequently in poor, black and other minority neighbourhoods. For the players living in these areas, this means they had to pay for poker balls and other items if they want to keep playing which increases the overall cost of participation. So even though the data used to create Pokestops and gyms in Pokemon Go is non-personal, it still has negative impacts on certain groups of players. In the end, data ethics should not only consider personal data, but also how data can affect people's lives, experiences and access to resources, entertainment and opportunities. Data is everywhere and being used to make decisions that have an impact on people. So what do we want to improve? The most important thing is to realise that data can tell us the biases that we humans have and help us to see our weaknesses. Ignoring the data will only serve to perpetuate human bias. It is critical then to consider data ethics, to ensure that we are aware of the challenges of managing data at scale, the consequences of reinforcing historical bias and what impact it has on people. This will mean we need to be open and transparent about our data practices so we can exploit the massive advances in technology in ways that benefit everyone.